Limits at infinity are all about understanding the big picture idea of functions and how they behave. When I look at a limit going to positive infinity, I'm wondering what happens on the right-hand end of the function. Even though that's way off at infinity, of course, way when as x gets really big, what is the function doing? And I'm looking at negative infinity, limits to negative infinity, I'm wondering when I go really, really on the negative end of the x-axis, what is my function doing? And this can also give us uh, a little insight into the behavior of our rational functions that we've dealt with a little bit before because they can have horizontal asymptotes. First, what we'll do, though, is we'll look at some polynomial functions. Now, these polynomials, as long as they have a degree of one or higher, they'll never have a horizontal asymptote. So really, we're just looking at the end behavior. Whenever you see the, a question that says describe the end behavior, all it's really asking you to do is find the limit to as x goes to infinity and the limit as x goes to minus infinity, just like we had here. And I said in the summary that the main thing to focus on is that the highest degree term dominates the behavior of the function as you get in towards infinity and minus infinity. Now, it'd be very silly to write something down like 5x squared minus x plus 1 equals 5x squared. But it's a very different thing if I was to write down something like this this limit equals the limit of 5x squared. Now it's understood since I had it over here that this is as x goes to infinity. The limits can equal even though the functions are not the same. So it would not be correct to just write this with just equals 5x squared. But this is true, this statement here about the limits is true because I can just focus on the highest degree term which here is the x squared. Remember degree is that exponent. This has an exponent of 1 implied. I'm not worried about the constant term, and so this has the highest degree right here. Now when I look at this, there isn't a method to just say, well, if it does this, then it's automatically going to be this answer. In other words, I have to think this through. But think about it. As x gets really big, what happens when I square x? It gets bigger, right? If I square 2, I get 4. If I square 4, I get 16. If I square 16, well, now I don't feel like doing that in my head, but you get the idea, right? It's certainly bigger than 16. And so I keep squaring these numbers, and they get bigger and bigger. And then what happens if I also multiply by 5? It doesn't get smaller, does it? It gets bigger even. So as x gets bigger, 5 times x squared also gets bigger. So this limit is equal to infinity. Now, one thing that's lucky for us as far as thinking about this is when you're dealing with a polynomial, and you take a limit as x goes to infinity or minus infinity, the answer is always going to be either infinity or minus infinity, because these graphs always behave in a similar way. There's a nice theorem, that's theorem 3 on page 147, that gives an overview of that. Let's think about the same idea with minus infinity. Once again, I can write that this equals the limit as x goes to minus infinity. I can either write it or leave it implied of 5x squared. But now I have to think, okay, when x gets really negative, what happens? Well, what happens when you multiply a negative times a negative? You get a positive, right? So if I take a really negative value, negative 2 times negative 2, I get positive 4. Negative 4 squared is positive 16. So actually, I get big numbers, but they're positive. And then when I multiply by 5, I get the even bigger numbers that are positive. So the more negative x gets, the more positive and big x squared gets. And when I multiply by 5, it just gets bigger. So this is also infinity. If you think about this, this is an x squared function, right? x squared minus x plus 1. This is a parabola, and so this would be probably a graph looking like this, and so that's why we're seeing this behavior. We're seeing it goes as we go out this way, it's going up, and as we go out this way, it's going up. And you can double-check this using some of your old algebra skills. And this would be my final answer. Now, remember, technically, these limits don't exist, but when a limit can be described with infinity or minus infinity, we go ahead and write it out. We don't write DNE. We write in what way it doesn't exist, and this is a special case of that. So polynomials, always going to be positive infinity or minus infinity. You just have to think through um, how it will behave as the x gets larger. Now, I don't know if you noticed the change. I just changed examples. The change is only on the degree. Remember, it was 5x squared. Now it's a 5x cubed. Why would I do that to you? Well, that cubed versus squared even versus odd power is going to have different behavior because of what happens when we square things versus cube them versus take them to the fifth power. Think about minus one. And that's actually part of theorem three. It's still true that this is equal 
now to the limit of 5x cubed, I still only care about the highest degree term, which is now 5x cubed. Now, when I go infinity, when I get larger and larger x's, x cubed gets bigger and bigger. 2 cubed is 8, for instance. So it just gets bigger and bigger. And when I multiply 5, it gets bigger and bigger. So this is actually equal to infinity. Okay. Now, what about minus infinity? Well, this is equal to the limit of 5x cubed. Just look at the highest degree term. I say, okay, minus infinity. So if, as I get more and more negative, like negative 1 cubed is negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1. So it's still negative 1. Okay, what about negative 2 cubed? Well, it's negative 2 times negative 2, which is positive 4, but then it's times another negative 2. It's negative 8. In other words, the negative sign is sticking around. So it's getting bigger. Every time I cube, I mean, it didn't with minus 1, it stayed the same. But in general, as I cube things, they get larger. But the sign's staying, sticking around because we have an odd power here. So this is going to be negative. And the 5 isn't going to change that because it, we're multiplying a positive times a negative, so it stays negative. So this is actually minus infinity. Now you may say, well, what if that was a negative 5? Then I would have written positive infinity here. This is negative infinity because it's positive 5. If that was minus, we'd have negative coming out of this times a negative. We'd end up with something else. And so you may remember in your college algebra course or algebra 2 or whatever the last course you had, that um, you could determine what a graph looked like by looking at the degree here and looking at the sign of this. And that's essentially, we're doing the same thing. So again, this is the same thing as describing the end behavior. I'm telling you, when you go off to the right of the graph, it's going to rise without bound. And on the left-hand side of the graph, it's going to fall without bound. That's essentially what I'm saying here. Now, all polynomials can be uh, the infinite limits, uh, or excuse me, the limits at infinity can be found in this way. What about our rational functions? All right, now I notice I changed the directions a little bit. Find the indica indicated limit and determine if the function has a horizontal asymptote. Now, if I was just going to find, and if I just had asked, tell me if there's a horizontal asymptote, I would have gotten rid of this. Well, I would have just had the function. I would say, okay, tell me if there's a horizontal asymptote or not. But then you would have brought that back. In other words, you got to find the infinite uh, the limit at infinity if you want to determine if there's a horizontal asymptote or not. There's some shortcut rules, and I'll talk about them, but really we're going to look at the limit aspect of it. The shortcut rules will always work. They, those are things you learned in algebra. But again, we're going to look at the calculus part of it. So let's go with we're just going to find this limit and then use that to determine if we have any kind of horizontal asymptote or not. So when I go to find the limit, the same rule applies even though this is a rational function. I'm just interested in the highest degree term of the numerator and the highest degree term of the denominator. All right, so I'm going to keep the 3x and I'm going to keep the x. All right, now you may notice that when I have 3x or x like this, the x's are going to cancel, right? So this is actually the limit. And now that we're on the last step, I'm going to remember where we're going. As x goes to infinity of 3. Remember uh, from our very first section, the limit of in any direction of a constant is that constant. So this is just 3. So that's our limit. The limit of this is 3. So in other words, as x gets really big, the graph is flattening out at 3. The graph is approaching a line at 3. Now since we're talking about a horizontal asymptote, yes, there is a horizontal asymptote. Anytime you get an answer for a limit as x goes to infinity or minus infinity, there's going to be a horizontal asymptote, and it will be of the form y equals some kind of constant. And in this case, it'll be y equals 3. So that would be the second part of my answer. Now, again, if I just asked you to find the horizontal asymptote of this function, you would have started out by writing out, okay, I need to find the limit as x goes to infinity. Now, if you're using the shortcut rules, which you'll find in theorem 4 on page 148, what's going on here is we have the same degree on the top and bottom. Anytime you have the same degree on the top and bottom, the limit's going to be a ratio of the coefficient of the largest degree term here and the coefficient here. And you may say, well, you circled nothing. There's no coefficient there. But there is. This is just an x, which is really 1 times x. So I could have looked at this and said, well, this is 3 over 1, which is 3. Absolutely true. Or I can use the calculus procedure we just used. I always like the calculus procedure because it means I don't have to memorize a gigantic list of rules like you see on page 148. But maybe you're already familiar with them, and then that makes it a little bit easier. 
All right, so we're going to look at a couple of cases of this. And actually, it covers the exact cases that you see in that theorem that I discussed a second ago. So again, remember, if you're, whether you're finding just a limit or determining if there's a horizontal asymptote, you're going to look at the highest degree terms of the numerator and the denominator. So this is equal to the limit of x cubed over x squared. Well, two of these are going to cancel with two of these, and I'm going to be left with the limit as x goes to infinity of x. Well, let's see, as x goes to infinity, what does x do? Well, I just said it, right? x goes to infinity. So this is actually equal to infinity. So there's my limit. But what about the horizontal asymptote? This is saying as you look on the end of the graph, the graph is going up, right? It's rising on the right-hand side. So it's not approaching any value. So in this case, there is no horizontal asymptote to answer the second part. So no horizontal asymptote. And so this is actually one of those cases. What's going on here is the degree on top is higher than the degree on the bottom. And so that's actually on theorem four, uh, part B, that's number three, case number uh, three. So it says the limit will be infinity or minus infinity, which we just saw, and it does not have a horizontal asymptote. Okay, think about it. What did we just see? The first one we saw had a horizontal asymptote. The degrees were the same. In this one, the degree was higher on the top than on the bottom of the function. So what's the left out case? Here we go. The degree on the bottom of the function or the denominator is higher than the degree in the numerator. But again, if you're not about memorizing those rules, you're just going to go with the steps. There's one set of steps to remember, and that's you're interested in the highest degree terms. This is x over x squared. The limit of this is equal to the limit of that. In other words, when I cancel out an x, this is the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x. Now this limit is actually 0. Okay, why? Well, if what is, what's larger? So 1 half, right? Versus 1 third, versus 1 fourth, versus 1 fifth. As this is getting bigger and bigger, the fraction overall is getting smaller. So this actually gets closer and closer to zero. I mean, eventually you're at one over a hundred, one over a thousand, one over a million. You're getting tinier and tinier. So as X gets really big, this gets closer and closer to zero. This is also a property uh, in your textbook. They have a whole list of properties in theorem two on page 146 that you can also memorize to remember this. Although, like I said, I'm not big on memorizing. I'm big on reasoning it through. But in this case, we're, we're pretty much always going to end up with zero. And so because I got an answer other than infinity or minus infinity, there is a horizontal asymptote, and that would be at y equals zero. And this follows right along with those shortcut rules. So in this part, I want you to be able to determine limits. So if I just say find the limit as x goes to infinity or minus infinity, I want you to be able to find that. And then I may ask you to find the horizontal asymptote. Then you got to know, okay, I got to find the limit as x goes to infinity. Or I might do something like this where I take care of two things at once and say, okay, find the limit and tell me if there's a horizontal asymptote. Unlike the vertical asymptotes, though, there will only be one horizontal asymptote if there is one at all.